Hi, this is Lolita Ritmanis, composer for Young Justice, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized Uncle Walker D zero one. Recognized Emily of Arden D one two. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode twenty four of Whelmed season three. My name is Rich, and with me is my co host Emily. Hey, everybody. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use that as a springboard to talk about creative writing along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we will be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. Meaning what happens here is all about who wants it more, and no one ever wants to win more than Vic Stone. But the old Vic can't beat this bruiser, so I better sub the new Vic into the game. Now we're talking! You're the true source of Granny's power, aren't you? You're the techno cancer she's using to hurt my friends. Well, guess who brought the techno cure? Booyah. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan. The title of this week's episode is Into the Breach. The release date was August 27th, 2019. The in-episode dates were January 25th through 26th. The writer was Jonathan Callen. The director was Vinton Huke. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. In addition to the regular cast and their familiar characters, we also have Troy Baker as Guy Gardner and Zara Fuzzle as Trajectory. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode takes place at the same time as last week and opens on the bio ship with Beast Boy texting Miss Martian before Vic explains the plan to the rest of the outsiders. Apparently, his cybernetic enhancements allow him to use his mind to tap into technological information. And ever since Halo got kidnapped, he's been searching the web for anything related to Granny Goodness to try and find a lead so that they can find Halo. His search led him to a storage facility with no network connectivity and a distinct apocalyptic tech signature. So now, the Outsiders are headed in to investigate. And break in. I'm sure nothing will blow up. After the credits, we see the Outsiders boom tube inside where they discover a giant apocalyptic device. But before Vic can figure out what it does, a portal opens and transports all of them to the ghost dimension. Ed teleports in to try and save everyone, but he's unable to teleport them out. As all of our heroes are struggling to survive, Gretchen Good appears and makes Beast Boy an offer. A one-on-one fight versus her. And if he wins, she'll let his friends go. The two face off, but despite Garfield's best efforts, Gretchen is still pummeling him. And while that battle's going on, Vic taps into some of the apocalyptic tech and wakes up inside the information highway to a fight against Overlord. Despite initially appearing to be killed by Overlord, Vic is able to overcome his opponent by accepting his new cybernetic powers and using them to shut Overlord down, freeing the Outsiders from the Ghost Dimension. The kids then work together to overpower and subdue Gretchen, while Vic and Blue Beetle destroy the apocalyptic device they discovered earlier. Gretchen and Overlord then disappear, and Vic follows them by creating a boom tube. Vic arrives on the orphanage and witnesses Gretchen and Granny Goodness merging back together into one terrifying form uh, and sees all of the mind-controlled heroes suffering immensely from everything that's been going on since last episode. He's able to use his cybernetic abilities to destroy the mask that's been mind-controlling Violet, and she then uses a new rainbow power to dispel the (laughs) anti-life equation's effects and heal everybody. Halo then uses her red aura to capture Granny and all of the high-powered team and League members work together to destroy the Ghost Dimension Generator. Superboy then informs Granny that Vandal Savage sent sent them to defeat her, which prompts her to create a boom tube in a rage and just escape. (laughs) I'm sure that won't have any lasting consequences. (laughs) Not at all. Violet, (laughs) Violet and Brion are reunited. Connor and McGann still aren't exactly sure where they stand, and Miss Martian tells Forager that it would be safer for him to return to New Genesis now, 
if he wants to. We then cut over to Apocalypse, where Granny Goodness explains to Darkseid that her mission was sabotaged by Vandal Savage. And then, back at the Premier Building, the Outsiders are worrying about what happened to their friends, only for all of them to suddenly appear via boom tube and tell them that the League will soon be returning to Earth with hundreds of rescued Metateens. In all the excitement, Beast Boy nominates Victor to join the Outsiders, and Vic agrees to take the position, officially adopting the name Cyborg. And to end the episode, we see that Lex Luthor has put together his own team of metahumans known as Infinity Incorporated, and they are officially out-trending the Outsiders. That's the most dramatic thing to happen in this episode, really, clearly. Social media push is where it's at. It's a scary and dramatic <laughs> world out there on the internet. Uh, yes. <laughs> all right, let's get the aster. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. All right. What do you got? So, random stuff. I'm just going to go through in order. Vic's powers are just heckin' cool. It's such an interesting expansion and reimagining of, like, what his powers usually are. Because I'm most I'm mostly familiar with this character from the Teen Titans cartoon, where, like, he kind of had this a little bit, but only in terms of, like, he was good with machines, and he was a cyborg, and that's cool. And then this is just like, hi, you can just travel the internet. I'm like, hi, there is so much going on with this, and I can't wait for you guys to do fascinating things with it in season four, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, ever ever since, I mean, originally he was he was just like the $6 million man, right? Like he had a few weapons and things like that. And then it kind of evolved into this kind yeah. of more almost nanotechy kind of shape-changing thing. And then the whole mother box or yeah. father box yeah. healing him thing took it to a whole new level. Um, I'm pretty sure that that was introduced with, gosh, was it like the new, like the, there was a new reimagining of the Justice of the Justice League where Vic was part of the core team. and uh, Like New 52 or Rebirth or something like that? You know, I'm not sure. We'd have to, we'll have to look that up. But when they started, when they introduced this thing about the mother box and father box, and then they used that in the movies as well, I, I, I love it. It makes perfect sense. It fits beautifully into the into the universe. I think it really harkens back to what what Jared Rasher and I were talking about in our discussion session about the evolution of characters uh, in, within mythology, like over time, and the things that you pick up and put down from a character over decades. You know, like Lex Luthor's been mad scientist and then businessman and then businessman, mad scientist. And then what are we going to pick and choose that feels right for the character? This thing with the with the whole mother box, father box, fourth world stuff, this is going to stick for him. This is this this really makes him more than, okay, well, you were a cyborg in 1980. How is that technology working out for you now? Right. Like it doesn't it, it always was a little hard to fathom. Yeah, like, how is yeah. he adapting to the massively changing technology? But then Greg and Brandon take it to a whole new level. Because they they are like okay if, are we gonna do this this is what we're gonna do we're gonna do this thing and I just picture them going like okay well what is the con- what are the consequences <laughs> what are the consequences of him being a father box okay evil and like all this all this other stuff right but then also like <laughs> right and then the and then once you've already had a conversation evil. about Halo being have you mentioned Halo as a mother box in a while Halo as a mother box yeah so it, when you start getting into that Halo as a mother box and then you you decide to go ahead and give her boom tube powers. Why are you not giving it to Vic? Like, Vic is like, yep, boom tube. So now Vic is more than just flying around. Like, Vic is boom tubing. I mean, I I could be wrong. I have not read enough recent stuff over the last maybe four or five years to be to be able to tell you whether or not this was introduced in the comics somewhere beforehand. But this concept of him boom tubing caught me way off guard. And I, I'm wondering if it caught other people off guard. It makes perfect sense, but then I'm like, oh... Vic just went to a whole new level, you know, because sometimes they'll, ha- they'll show him with like yeah. jet boots and flying and like stuff like that. But like the ability to, it's not even just teleporting, like boom tubing, serious tech, like across g- the galaxy kind of movement. And it just like, it takes, takes Vic and puts him on a level that I think really, really makes him, it, it just makes him so good and so powerful and still sticks with his through line of his character so well. Amazing. Also, yeah. no boom tubes in the house. No boom tubes in the house. Unless right. they're bringing friends Apparently. back to safety. Exactly. Apparently. And when he's not That's on the, the one exception. <laughs> the end of the boom tube noise. It just, it just reminds me of the Protean City Comics ongoing joke that they have that whenever they show in their, in their actual play, whenever they cut to the like 
orphanage for wayward right. super children. Uh, there will always be kids playing no basketball powers. outside, yeah, and exactly. one of them will always shout, exactly. "No powers! No powers!" <laughs> and it's my favorite. We love it. That's right. Uh, check out Protean City Comics. <laughs> other other notes. Some random stuff here. I really, I rewatching this episode, I really liked Bart getting to have some shenanigans, even though there's a lot in this episode that is very dark and very heavy for a couple of scenes. It's real nice seeing the kids be kids again, because we don't get a lot of it this season just because everybody's older and I get it. I get why it happens. But at the same time, like, yay, we're having a little mission where you guys break into a warehouse and you tell jokes and you blew something up. It's old times. And he's just so excited. This is this is a side note for for some for some shipping inclined folks. But I had a thought on my ten million three mm-hmm. watch of this when they when we got we got you know people know by this point that you and me just kind of headcanon Ed and Bart as a couple at this point. Yeah, yeah, it's we're just, like they're yeah, dating. Just is. <laughs> we just they are. We've accepted this. If you watch that scene, Ed teleports directly. To, to Bart, not to anybody else. He t- teleports directly to Bart. And then oh, yeah. my brain, which is still occasionally wired to be a 13-year-old writing Young Justice fan fiction, was like, there is a very, very nice, cute, fluff fic concept buried somewhere in here about how like it's easier for Ed to teleport to like things and people that, that he has a strong with? emotional oh, connection yeah, yeah, to. Yeah. And he's like, oh, no, I totally buy into that. Yeah. Yes. Because like season three was like, I have to be able to see where I'm going. And now you're able to teleport into a pocket dimension. And I'm like, I feel like there's some sort of oh, no. like sub level here of like I can teleport to things I know really really oh, yeah. well like your boyfriend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is definitely a masks moment too, a masks role playing game moment too, where you're like, okay, you know, you're going to be pushing the limits of your powers. Let's do this, right? And I'm only I'm going to how do you use team to help? Right, exactly. What's, how are you using team? I'm just being his boyfriend. <laughs> nice. Exactly. I love it. Probably my silliest thought on this episode, but I stand by it. This episode Feel needs free a little to take silly. My head cannons and run with them, kids. Nice. Also, other things on the other end of the spectrum, uh, the fight between Granny and Beast Boy is so much on every watch through. I'm like, ah, this is painful to watch, and so much of it is in the sound design. Like you wouldn't, if you told me there was going to be a fight on this show that's like. A, a green snake attacking an old woman and it's gonna be like a lot i'd be like that's that sounds ridiculous and then you watch it and you're like no it's because the sound design makes you feel every single hit in this show because yes. it's painful because yes. it all matters yes because this show makes violence count which says a lot yeah but yeah shout out to the sound designers on this episode y'all are good and then having these two vastly different fights that are happening simultaneously is really cool to watch and kind of helps split up that violence in a lot of ways, just because you can, it, they go back and forth, not focusing on either one for too long. So even though they are both these very intense scenes, you kind of get like a little bit of a respite for just that moment of cutting back and forth. You're like, okay, can I not see Beast Boy be brutalized for five seconds? And they're like, you want to see two robot guys punch each other i'm like sure that's a different choice (laughs) it's something different to watch and even just the very the nice little thing of like using color to differentiate between the two is such a simple but effective way of like having your brain keep track of things like you're you know those two fights are different but even just that little that little shift is nice it's very nice yeah no but i do love i do love the teamwork in this episode i do love seeing all of these kids getting they work together and they all support each other and once beast boy's done with his little one-on-one fight and they're all back together they're all like you know what we're gonna support each other and work together and everybody's gonna have a purpose in this fight and it's nice i like it me too and that's the thing, like, like in the, I mean, it's just like harkens back in, in a lot of ways. It's like the outsider's version of the season one finale in some ways, right? You get that, you get yeah. all that teamwork, that coordination. You you compare that with like, you know, Welcome to Happy Harbor, you know, which, <laughs> which was the episode of which we do not speak. Yeah, right. That one. I'm bring I'm bringing it all the way back. Yeah, comparing the the growth and the and the bonding, and it's fantastic. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's very nice. 
I also, as as a little thing, shout out to Zeno Robinson for just his delivery power, his delivery of uh, rainbow power. It just, <laughs> I don't know. Like, it's half of his lines this episode have this tone of, yeah, sure, this might as well happen. Yep. And I love it. <laughs> It works so well because it's just like Cyborg is just, he's used to it, but he's still so not used to anything in the way that everybody else is. And I love it that his his way of accepting this is going, you know what? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Sure. But I, I think also too, what I was getting out of it when I was watching it was this idea that he, when he's finally starting, he's finally starting to accept stuff, right? Too. So he's just, instead of like storming out yeah. and like leaving rooms and leaving holiday parties, right? He's seeing something and he's he's checking it out and he's like, that rainbow power, cool. It's this, okay, I'm seeing all of this with fresh eyes now and in a way that I can accept now because I'm learning to accept myself now, right? That's the way, I mean, I may be overreading yeah. it, but I really liked it. And Zeno, hats off, that was some great delivery, I agree. I think it's I think it's a good combination of both. It gives us that like, because it's not him being like, yeah, this is awesome, but he's also not like, why is everything so strange? <laughs> yeah. It's like a nice little medium point right, between the right. two where he's like, life's weird, right, but you know my life what? Now. We're running I'm with it. I'm owning this life. We're running <laughs> right. with it. We're accepting it. Right. And then right after that, we get a scene that hurt my heart when it first premiered and still hurts my heart rewatching it. We got a little thing after all of that, after everything has been fixed and everything should be happy, you get... That after like uh, Brion and Halo reunite, they immediately cut to Connor and Began, who just immediately look at each other and then look away, and it hurts because uh, they're yeah. in a place right now, yeah. and it hurts me. But even the fact that that's followed up by not just leaving it at that, because a lot of shows would just leave it at like, see, we look, we acknowledge that they're thinking thoughts, and I'm like, no, let let them speak, and Young Justice lets them speak, lets them have this little honest emotional check-in and having their willingness to be like, I don't know, give me a minute. We just almost died. Is just, it hurts my heart, but in a good way. <laughs> that phrase I've been saying for three episodes where I'm just like, hi, this super Martian subplot makes me sad, but like a good sad. <laughs> yeah. I like that it makes me sad because it means the show is bothering to care, which I appreciate. I love that little scene, even though it like does, it makes me sad, but I like that it's, able to make me sad in a show that this episode could have so easily been just like we're just gonna punch our way to greatness and save everybody they're like wait 30 seconds these two need to talk about their feelings and i'm like i'm here for it more feelings discussion <laughs> on a happier note things that make me smile about this episode i do i love that after everybody comes back after the outsiders have been like our friends are dead and we are alone <laughs> which is the tone of them all sitting yep. on that couch and everybody yep. just appears and like, great, wonderful, our friends aren't dead. We totally believed you guys were alive. Um, and Beast Boy just being like, Cyborg's part of the Outsiders now. I love how like Superboy and everybody goes, have you asked Victor yet? <laughs> yes. <laughs> have you checked if he wants this? Because that's also so much how they did things back in season one too. Where like Zatanna shows up and they're like, you're ours now. Yeah, we claim you. Oh, okay. Because even like Zatanna was actually the opposite. Zatanna was, I'm part of this team <laughs> yeah, that's now. Fair. And everyone went, okay. Very fair. That's a fair interpretation. Oh, she's like, I don't even care if you don't want me. <laughs> I'm here. But everyone was like, no, you're cool. You can stay. And so they have to like just stop them all and be like, hi, we know you're excited. We're all very excited for you. Have you asked the teenage robot boy what he wants to do? Nice. <laughs> Has anyone asked? <laughs> I love them. But speaking of season one, there is also on my... I feel like I noticed this in my first couple of watch throughs, but it really hit me this time through paying attention to everything. After all of that, we get this nice like group shot of everybody there. And they're of the original team from season one minus Wally. and. Like I have said about a lot of things lately, it hits really hard, but in a good way, especially since it's composed the way that shot is made up, the way they designed that shot. You notice the empty space there yeah. because there is a way to group all of those characters and frame that shot and crop that shot. So you're like, look, five heroes, no gaps, just five heroes and they're here and it's great. Whereas by the fact that they leave just enough space that you're like, Wally should be in this photo, but he's not. 
And it you feel and you notice that even without the show. Because the show doesn't be like, look, here is this big Wally sized outline. It's just like, there is enough space here for one more person and he's not here and you're going to notice. Yeah. I don't. I'm processing emotions. That's why I'm like, I'm just saying yes. Half of my notes are just like, this hurts. And Rich is like, you're right. <laughs> and then we move on. I don't, you know, you're right. You're right. You're always right. I'm not always right. But when I am right, it's about characters feeling things. <laughs> <laughs> Brand is strong. But to something about a character not feeling anything, because that's a segue. I just have a note here that just says, Lex Luthor, mind controlling another person and forcing her to commit crimes against her will just to get a hashtag trending. There are easier and less reprehensible ways to go viral, Lex. Like having Batman put a disguise on and Miss Martian shape change herself into a little girl? Less complicated? Less reprehensible? I don't know about easier. Hey. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm like, hey. <laughs> Bat- not to defend Batman and Miss Martian's <laughs> chaos this season, but neither of them mind controlled a supervillain into committing a crime. That's true. Uh, I I will point out that they happen to have uh, an Ivo android at hand, though. <laughs> Fair. They might have just found those in the it's warehouse. Possible. We don't know what else is being stored there. I mean, if Lex had a, you know, Ivo android. But I'm just so, but my brain is just like, okay, but what if Lex did actually try like less horrible Lex Luthor supervillain ways of getting these kids trending? And it's just like, give them a puppy, design a fun mascot, <laughs> give them a TikTok account, and have oh them do gosh. whatever the latest trending thing so is. So all of this keeps flashing me back to there's an episode in Justice League Unlimited called The Ultimate. And it was Justice League Unlimited's uh, like re, like their attempt to bring into the future. The Runaways, basically, that we call the Runaways in the show. So, yeah. you know, it was like, uh, God, it was Wind Dragon, and then the two shape changers that were supposed to be Xan and Jaina, Long Shadow, and they were being, they were branding, they were being branded and by Max Lord, and Max Lord's a character from the comics who's, who was involved in Justice League International and all that, and the death of Ted Cord and a bunch of stuff. But anyway, it just keeps reminding me of, like, this is very much... And Max is not Lex, but, like, Max <laughs> is, like... Yeah, I mean, Max is a businessman, businessman, right? I have such mixed feelings about Max Lord. But anyway, it reminds me of the same thing. But it, there's a whole scene where it was, like, one of the kids was, like... You know, one of the Ultimate Men was, like, oh, I don't know about doing this anymore. And, and, and Max is, like, have you seen the new action figures? <laughs> you know, or whatever. And it's just like, this is what I'm picturing in my head when you're talking about Lex, like, give him a puppy. And it's like, have you seen the action figures, kids? You know, we've got a Saturday morning Look cartoon. Yeah, exactly. You're on a lunchbox. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Not so much now. But that's, those are most of, I think those are all of my notes. Unless you have anything to add to my notes, we can move on to Neil. No, a lot of my note, a lot of my notes were folded into some of your notes uh, as well, and a lot of it was about this transformation of cyborg and this Lex Luthor it's nonsense good. as well. And even just that way of all the ways that they fold it back on the season so far that the second they mention, they're like, "This is how cyborgs' powers work." You're like, everything makes sense now. It's so good. It's so good. Uh, Neil says, "Is." Is it a team phone? Why would Beast Boy have have McGann in there as Miss Martian? I'm going to go with the theory I have for a lot of things that is all all superheroes have two phones or at least <laughs> right. two phone numbers. Right, exactly. I'm big on that. Unless stated otherwise. <laughs> they got the drop down menu on their iPhone says like main phone, you know, like superhero. Main phone, superhero, superhero phone. phone. It's a building 16, of course, at Granny Studio, right out of the gate. There are only two numbers. That's right. The back and forth between Lex and Infinity Incorporated and the Outsiders in the X Pit is amazing. And then add in Vic versus Overlord and it is a battle on three completely different fronts. It's still impressive to me how well it works in this episode. You can overdo the number of fight scenes in a in a in a movie. I mean, switching like you were talking about earlier, like switching back and forth between 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 scenes can even even if it's one fight scene, another fight scene gives you some relief from the monotony yeah. in some ways, or like the tension, or whatever it happens to be. But like, I think the Star Wars prequel, like Episode One, I think it had four different things going on at the same time, and it was hard to be like four pushed it a little too far. 
three is tough to do. Two seems fine, but like three, tough to do. And they really pulled it off. Especially, and part of it, I think, is why this episode works with it, is like the Infinity Incorporated one, we don't see much of the actual fight scene. Like that's not what's important with the Infinity Incorporated thing. And then the yes. Vic and Garfield fight scenes affect each other. Like as you're watching the Garfield fight scene, you are thinking about Vic doing his because you know if Vic wins, right. then it frees Garfield from his thing. So cutting back and forth between them works because they're not isolated incidents. They're things that are connected to each other. Yeah. Because you're like, if Garfield wins, then everybody gets out. If Vic wins, then everybody gets out. And so you're just kind of seeing who wins which. It's a race and it works. Yeah, absolutely. And this whole situation with Vic's conflict feeding into the other conflict and back and forth. I'm going to get into some more detail on the Canary Debrief, I think. We're going to talk about that and how to handle that in some tabletop games and why you'd want to do it. Uh, he also says, let's see, I realized that the threat was very real of Beast Boy being dead at the end of his fight with Granny or Cyborg versus Overlord. Uh, to me, that's great. And there is the ability to have that kind of real world threat on the show. And part of that definitely comes uh, with the move off of Cartoon Network, too. because And it's true. Like, yeah, everybody made it out. You know, but people could have died. And yeah. I think I don't I don't I don't know in my in my heart if I really felt like somebody was going to die, but I felt more about it than I would have if it had been a cartoon network. Like <laughs> I'm like, are you yeah. gonna do this to us again? Is something going to happen? Right. And even like there's lasting damage because of it. Like Beast Boy is in a sling and stuff for the next couple of episodes. Yeah, exactly. And it, you know what? And if it, I'm again, remembering correctly. And, and again, it flashes back to, to Wally when he broke his arm, right? And he was on that cast for multiple episodes as well. And then in, God, what was that, Failsafe, where yeah. he didn't have it all of a sudden, and none of us noticed it until flashback when we realized that was his residual self-image. Interesting. The show's too good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Neil, double the granny, double the fun. The merge that will haunt us all. That's what he said. I absolutely agree. We don't need to talk about that scene. It's fine. <laughs> I'll admit it. They would all be chipped beef on toast without Guy. <laughs> Neil is going to defend Guy Gardner. And you know what? Until yes, forever. And when he's made it clear he's not defending Guy as a person. He's defending Guy in the context of the show. And I, Fair and enough. I, and I don't think I, I argue with him too much on that. <laughs> His last note is, Hashtag, I guess I'm an outsider. Just doesn't have the same ring to it, I guess. I like it. I Maybe. support it. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> All right. I showed up late to the party, but I'm still enthusiastic about being here. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Uh, all right. Let's wrap out of this Aster and we'll head into, the, head into all of our middle of the show business and then head into some fan service and crashing the mode. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes that we review. There were a few things we could talk about this week, like the fact that last episode and this episode took place at the same time, which can be handled really, really well when you are setting up something with conscious creation like this uh, team does, or how you can choreograph conflicts in tabletop role-playing games that happen in two different locations. But I wanted to take a moment to talk about something Emily's mentioned in the past, how fight choreography in and of itself is a story, and how a good combat reflects as much character growth as any other scene. In this case, let's look at Vic. To survive this fight, much less succeed in it, Vic has to accept his new life in a way he hasn't been able to do up to now. He has to work through his resentment of himself, his father, his prosthetics, everything. He's been in denial of himself since the moment of the accident and been longing for a past and dreams that don't exist anymore. Where Beast Boy had to go through nightmare monkeys to find himself, Vic had to be given a choice that involved his old body and his new one. He had to recognize that the old residual self-image he had not only wasn't true, holding on to it was going to kill him. In this case, literally, but in the real world, metaphorically as well. When your combats happen, think of them as any other conflict. The antagonist in this fight wasn't Overlord. Overlord was just the villain. 
The antagonist, the thing getting in the way of Vic's goals, was himself. And the small steps we see him struggle through earlier in the season culminated beautifully in this particular fight. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other creative works we think Young Justice fans will love. As of this recording, uh, we just spotted at YJ Tigris is doing 366 days of Young Justice, and we are now on day 22. Over on Twitter, just to just for people who are wondering, since ads exist all over the place, on Twitter this is happening. Sorry, Tigris. Yeah, at YJ Tigris on Twitter, 366 days of Young Justice. And it looks like, at least at the moment for this month, they're doing some comparison shots, side-by-side shots of like first season characters look versus third season characters look, which are pretty cool. But one of them that was kind of funny we were noticing, of course, there was Tula up there and Tula pretty much just no changes. She's only in season one. I'm a little like it would have hurt my heart too much if she, if uh, this person had gone with uh, the hologram of Tula as the second photo. That is exactly what I was thinking. That would have been wow. Anyway, we'll have a link. We have a link over. You can also more than likely head over to uh, to the YJ Files uh, Twitter feed, and uh, we'll have retweeted uh, some of those as well. You can check it there, or go over to at YJ Tigris on Twitter. All right, crash in the mode. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in Season 3. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on our wild imaginations. <laughs> Lights of fancy. <laughs> that too. Tinfoil hats. Exactly. Any of the above. All of the above. <laughs> if you're a spoiler wary, this is your warning. All right, we're getting close to the end of this ep- this season. I was I have to say I was a little surprised no more cyborg the rest of the season, yeah? He's around. Yeah, but okay. He well, doesn't f- play the biggest part, fair. but I he's was around. Al- I was like I was like, "Oh, he accepted his role. Yay!" And then I was looking to see if there was something else coming up for Zeno. I agree. It's it's the thing where it's like he gets his kind of wrap up in this episode and then we've still got stuff we've kind of got to deal with. With some of the other characters. So Cyborg's like, you accepted yourself, good. We're going to just put you over here for a minute. We got a season four. We promise we'll do more stuff with you. But like right now, you just need to, please. We've got like 50 episodes or 50 minutes to do everything else for the rest of the season. Yeah. Uh, I kind of get it. I kind of get it. I I noticed looking, because I watched the rest of the episodes of the season, writing outlines recently. Cyborg plays a role in both of the last episodes, but doesn't have lines. (laughs) In that okay. way where they're just like, there's so much happening, guys. We got a, such a big cast. Like he does he does the hacking thing in the season finale, but right. but Zeno sadly doesn't get any lines for that. They just have Cyborg just do it. Uh yeah. and he and he gets kidnapped with Halo in the second to last episode, like benevolently kidnapped by That's, uh, Metron. Yeah. That's but right. But they're just That's speaking right. like mother boxes and father boxes. So, you know, again, doesn't get any lines. <laughs> so they're still participating. Uh, they just, that is totally fair. He just doesn't get to talk for a bit. <laughs> he gets to, to bomb. Season four? Or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Controversial <laughs> theories. Cyborg will talk in season four. <laughs> Uh, the other thing uh, Neil had brought up too, we were talking about the Brian Violet reunion and and most of the interactions for Brian on these like succeeding viewings are so painful. On rewatch, knowing what's coming in short order, yeah, I still Brian. feel like I even need to watch through again from the beginning and see like from the very very early on. The one one thing that he did in that reporter's interview in the very first episode, yep. it gets it gets me like when she says, "What's it like to be just sixteen minutes from the crown?" and he like clenches his fist and it looks yeah, like he's getting mad. A- and I was like, "What?" And then we don't really see any of that evidence of like, like he doesn't he does he and his brother seem to get along and care about each other. And I, I believe that there's something there, but like, yeah, right, like way back then, even then. And I was like, "That's a, that was an interesting choice that didn't seem to follow through, but apparently oh, did. Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. Death, carnage, and regicide or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, Neil, we agree with you, I think, on that one. Uh, outside of that, I'm trying to think if there's a lot going on 
I mean, there was so much going on in this episode that was a lot of combat, but it was still a lot of character development combat and and like resolution. <laughs> the whole reveal of Overlord, like like when when Overlord was revealed to be tiny, and then um, you jump in this thing, and you're like, why? They, what kind of a threat is that? And then you get Vic in there with them, and like, oh oh oh, wow, they made him horrifying all of a sudden. Yep. But like there was, there was a lot of that and a lot of resolution and and as just like with the other seasons as we're getting closer to the end there's not as much crashing the mode to worry about that big brown thing but I can't think of anything else can you I think the foreshadowing this episode is that the Clamulons will be the huge villain of season four I mean it's going to be Legion all the way so I mean there's no reason why not to have the Clamulons seriously <laughs> it would not be the weirdest thing that showed up in a Legion comic that's for sure oh really oh really it's okay I. <laughs> Before we wrap up, if we're talking about Legion and how weird it is, isn't there like one of the main guys is like bouncing boy where like his power is just being good at bouncing? Yeah, uh, Jamie Catania and I uh, do almost like a sub little secret origin love story to bouncing boy uh, (laughs) and how they reinvented him for the Legion of Superheroes animated series. And he was great. Chuck Tane. (laughs) Chuck Tane is great. And Chuck Tane was like my hero as a kid, mostly because he was like this superhero that was had like, okay, I mean, I'm sorry, no offense, Chuck Tane, the lamest power, like the lamest power to describe to anyone outside of matter eater lad. He eats matter. Matter eater lad, he eats matter. He can eat anything. Good for him. At one point, he ate a thing called the miracle machine that could create and change reality and went insane. He did it to save the universe. But he was a cornerstone character in the Legion of Superheroes. Anyway. Gosh, I but, love comics. <laughs> it was being written by a 14-year-old. Give it a break. So anyway. No, that wasn't a sarcasm. <laughs> that was a completely genuine, gosh, I love comics. <laughs> Good. Because in what other medium could yeah. you tell that story? <laughs> exactly. None. Exactly. Zero. None. None. Definitely go, if you if, listeners, if you haven't heard Jamie Catania's three-part episode, that we had to trim down to three parts because there was just too much to talk about. I think we only got to the fifth reboot. Uh, so, like, yeah, seriously. Uh, go check that out. You can hear more about good old Bouncing Boy. Anyway, Clamulons, 100 Prep for season two. 100%. 100%. All right. And with, all, with that, I think we can say it out of the Watchtower. Thank you all for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at theyjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us for comments and conversation on YouTube and then on Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. Please make our job easier. (laughs) If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.